Okay, so what did we do last time? So recall, what did we do last time? We proved two things. Uh, we had the, the final theorem about the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which were uh, if, well, let's do an if and only if. So u, u and v are functions from R2 to R, are R2 differentiable. and satisfy Cauchy-Riemann if, uh, well, implies f being u plus iv is holomorphic and, of course, the other direction. Okay, so that was a complete characterization of holomorphic functions. And, uh, we, and then we started looking at power series and we proved the following theorem of Hadamard that, uh, let f of z be a power series, let's center it at zero so I don't have to put minus z zero everywhere, um, is a power series, then there exists an r, and by the way, we know what r is, it's one over l, where l is the limb soup of the a n's to the one over n, so r is in either zero, it's allowed to be zero and infinity, it's allowed to be infinity, such that for all z less than r, the series converges absolutely. And for all z bigger than r, the series diverges. And part two is an exercise that you'll hand in on, on Friday. We proved part one and um, there's a, and moreover, for all, so the convergence, the convergence, convergence is uniform for all z less than some r strictly less than big R. So this last part we didn't, uh, we didn't prove, but it follows from the proof that we gave, because recall, Recall what we did. We uh, we saw that if z is less than, let's say, little r less than big R, and big R is one over l, then we can make epsilon so small, make epsilon small, so that uh, l times z is less than, well, um, is less than r over r, which is less than Let's see, how do I want to say this? Is less than R over, I'm multiplying by L. Well, it's strictly less than one. It's less than R1, <laughs> less than one. Ah. All I'm trying to say, all I'm trying to say, and, and then of course we could, we could stick in here, there's room to stick L plus epsilon Z to be less than R1, less than one. So if, if you give yourself a little bit of a fixed distance, if you give yourself a little fixed distance away from R, then in fact, the tail, we, we looked at the tail, um, a n z to the n, in absolute value, this is bounded by, eventually, the a n's after a certain point are all bounded by L plus epsilon, so that's the point at which we start. I'm just reviewing the argument quickly. So, th so this is bounded by um, L plus epsilon, L plus epsilon times Z to the N, which of course is the tail of R1 to the N, which converges. And the point that I want to make is that this, um, if we make Z less than some little r less than uh, big R, then this is uniform. This convergence is uniform. All we use is that Z is less than little r. Okay. So I want to get one extra bit out of the proof, which is the uniform convergence. Okay, and then the last thing we, so far so good? Any questions? This is review. Great, thank you, Kayla. The thumbs up really help. I, I can tell your, uh, I can tell my screen is working and that my audio is working. Um, and the last thing we did is the theorem that analytic implies holomorphic. So that is, i.e., 
if f is a power series, as usual, I'll center things at the origin until I need to not center it at the origin. If f is a power series um, with a positive region of convergence, radius of convergence, then um, let's do a couple of things. Well, first of all, f prime exists, exists, and f prime is equal to, let's call it g, which is given by the series a n z to the n minus one. In other words, term-wise differentiation. And g has same radius of convergence. That's what we started working on last time. And I gave a quick sketch, and now we're going to do it sort of more rigorously. So far, so good. OK, so a couple of things. So first of all, the fact that G has the same R follows from the fact that N to the 1 over N has limit, which is equal to 1. We saw that last time. Um, so this function does converge. And now let's, so let's look at, so the proof, we'll, we'll look at what differentiation in uh, f of z looks like. And I, I guess I'm claiming that the derivative is supposed to be g of z. So that's this difference function. And let's write this in a funny way. Um, f of z plus h minus f of z over h minus sn z plus h minus sn of z over h uh, plus sn of z plus h minus sn of z over h minus sn prime of z. sn, of course, by sn, I mean the um, sn is the finite polynomial and going up to capital N, a n z to the n. Uh, what was g again? g was the, was the derivative of f. Okay. So, so I'm defining a new power series by n a n z to the n minus 1. That new power series has the same radius as r by Hadamard's formula. So it makes perfect sense. And of course, I'll take uh, in this, in everything that I'm about to do, I'll take z and h, and z and z plus h less than r. So wherever, wherever r is, I need not only z inside of r, but I need z plus h to be inside of r. So this will be z, and this will be z plus h. And in fact, I can take a little ball so that all, all h of a certain size will still be, will still have this property. Okay. So all I'm doing is taking, um, I'm taking the definition of differentiation and I'm saying, I want to prove that it's close, that it in the limit approaches G of Z. And this is the three epsilon proof. We're going to add and subtract a bunch of stuff. So we'll add and subtract the partial. See, this is going to be close to this because the SNs are approaching F. But I've subtracted something, so I have to add it back in. Now, what is this going to approach when h goes to 0? It's going to approach its derivative, because this is a finite polynomial. And finite polynomials, there's no problem differentiating. I don't think I have to spell that out to you. It's the same as why finite polynomials are, have their derivatives in, uh, the real, in real variables. Um, but of course, I've subtracted sn, so I have to add sn back in, sn prime, minus g. And of course, G is also a convergent power series, so this will be close. So what I really want to say is that the absolute value, the absolute value of this difference is no bigger than this difference plus this difference plus that difference. Of course, I'm using the triangle inequality. So far, so good. Now, what do we know about these things? Let's see. Um, we know that... For example, the series Sn prime does indeed converge to G and does so uniformly for all, uh, for all Z less than a little neighborhood. So in fact, what we want to do here is sneak in a little, little R less than big R so that we can say this is uniform. So um, we know that for any epsilon, there exists a big N such that for all Z less than r, 
but here's where we're using the uniformity, uh, this thing is small. Absolute value Sn of z, Sn of z minus g of z is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's one thing that we know. So by making n, uh, let's see, really the way, the way to say this is there exists an n1 so that for all z uh, and for all n greater than n1. So once you've taken enough terms in the, in the series that's converging to z, to g, uh, all future terms will be less than epsilon uniformly in this, in this neighborhood. Okay, um, great. Uh, how about this sum? What do we know about this, this term? Well, for any fixed n, for all fixed n, this thing is a polynomial and polynomials differentiate. And for all epsilon positive, uh, there exists a delta positive so that for all h of size less than delta, and of course delta will be sufficiently small that z plus h delta, delta is small enough that z plus h is less than our little r less than big R. So that for all uh, h less than delta, um, Sn of z plus h minus Sn of z over h minus Sn prime of z is less than epsilon. That's just saying that the function Sn, which is a finite polynomial, no matter what the degree of the polynomial is, I mean, the epsilon will depend on the degree, of course, but for every n, uh, sorry, the delta will depend on the degree. For every n, we have a polynomial. What does it mean we have a polynomial? That means for every epsilon, we have a delta, so that if h is less than delta, then this difference is less than epsilon, okay? And, uh, and the last thing, so that, that will make this middle term small. The hardest thing is to make this term small. It's not the hardest, none of this is hard, but uh, we actually have to do something to make this term small. So far, so good? Is everybody with me? What do you think we have to do to make that term small? See, S is converging to F, and, and this S is converging to this F. F S of N, Sn of Z plus H is converging to F of Z plus H, and Sn of Z is converging to F of Z. But there's this over H, which is blowing up. So that's what we have to be a little bit careful about. Any ideas? Am I going too fast? You want a minute to think about it and try to try to do it yourself? Want to write in the chat, give me a minute or just go ahead. Could we like switch them? Like put F of Z plus H with SN Z plus H and vice versa and then split them apart and show convergence separately or something? So we, um, we certainly know, okay, so uh, switching is the, is the right first idea we certainly know that things are converging absolutely. So we can interchange all those summations as much as we want. F is an infinite sum, S is the finite sum, so this difference will be the tail. So this difference, this difference, uh, let me not write it again, it's equal in absolute value to one over H times the tail, the sum of N bigger than N, um, A N Z, z plus h to the n would, would come from the first term and the second term would look exactly the same except with a z to the n. So, so far I haven't done anything that's an exact equality. And the thing that I'm worried about is this one of, whoops, is this one over h. Um, this is converging just fine. Use the binomial expansion perhaps? Yes. Exactly. That is exactly what we need to do. 
If we use the binomial expansion, we see here one over H. In fact, we can, well, we'll pull the absolute values inside in a second. The AN is fine. What is this difference? By the binomial expansion, this is exactly equal to um, H times uh, Z plus H to the N minus one plus Z plus H to the N minus two Z plus and so on up to Z to the N minus one. Does everybody know what I'm using here? This is using something like a to the n minus b to the n is equal to a minus b times a to the n minus 1 plus a to the n minus 1b and so on up to b to the n minus 1. Uh, uh, plus b to the n minus 1. That is what I'm using. Right, just a simple identity. Everybody knows this. This is what you used when you did calculus in high school or whatever, right? Middle school, some of you. Um, so, so all I'm doing is plugging in A equals Z plus H, B equals Z. So I get this thing out, out here, but Z plus H minus Z is H. That's the key step to get an H on top to kill the H on bottom. Does that make sense? So these two H's, let me be fancy. These two H's are gone. <laughs> See, that's one thing I can't do. Well, if I, the geometry guys all have these cool pens with lots of colors. <laughs> I think they actually use them. I don't, uh, even if I had a cool pen with lots of colors, I would just spend the entire lecture on black or something. Um, but now I have a toy. Um, okay, so the H is cancel, and now we can use inequalities. Uh, some n greater than n. Let's do triangle inequality. Now, how am I going to bound all of this stuff? Z plus H and Z are both, recall, recall, both Z plus H and Z are bounded by little r. Little r less than big R. And how many of them are there? So, so each of these terms can be bounded by little r to the n minus 1. And how many of them are there? How many terms is a to the over here? How many terms are there here? N. N, yes. Have I lost you? Does everyone know the answer and they're just too shy and you're, you're worried if it's N or really N minus one or something? No, everybody knows, right? Yeah, you guys are being shy. Come on, we know each other now. This is week three already. Uh, N, exactly. Which, by the way, is the series, the absolute convergence of the series G, since R is less than big R. So we've given this bound and by absolute convergence of G on Z less than R, including the case Z equals little r, which is less than R. This thing, by this absolute convergence, for all epsilon, there exists an N2, so that for all N greater than N2, this thing is less than epsilon. Does everybody see that? Is anyone confused about this, this bit of analysis? Are we bored or lost? I'm, I'm seeing lots of, uh, I don't see a lot of like, yeah, move on old man, I'm, I, I know all this. Who can I pick on? Anna, are you, are you bored or lost? Or you're okay? I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thomas, it's okay? Uh, I'm actually not sure what you did in that last step. <laughs> oh, okay. When did we get absolute convergence of Z or of G? That was the very first thing that G has the same radius of convergence. I'm using, I'm using, uh, I'm using this Hadamard formula. For all Z less than R, the series converges absolutely. And in fact, uniformly, if we stick, if we keep some distance away from R. Any distance, any positive distance away from R. Hannah, does that make sense?
Is Sean, am I, did I lose you? I'm both uh, bored and lost, weirdly. Oh, enough. no, you're both bored and lost. <laughs> um, I am too sleepy. I'm still waking up, so okay. my brain's not working. And also, I saw this proof earlier. So Okay, fine. So leave you alone, and you'll watch I'll the video fine. if you need to. Yeah. Okay. A anybody who is awake and, and uh, wants to talk about any part of this? Rishab? Is it okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're trying to prove that F is holomorphic. Uh, we know that G has the same radius of convergence as F. What does that mean? That means that if I write a n times n times z to the n minus 1, which was the thing that defined z, the tail of that will be small. Okay. So now what is the order? Uh, can you see all three of these things at the same time? I don't know how good the, vi the video quality is. If I, zoom, if I zoom out this far, you can still see it? Great. Great. Okay. So we have these three things. For any epsilon, I, I have to make n large enough that this thing is less than epsilon. For every n and every epsilon, I can make h less than delta and make this thing less than epsilon. And for any epsilon, uh, there is an n2 so that n being bigger than n2 makes this first term, wherever it was, this first term less than epsilon. So we choose an epsilon, arbitrary, right? This is, I think I said last time, this is a three epsilon proof. So how do we finish this? Choose arbitrary epsilon positive. Um, let n be bigger than both n1 and n2 so that I can use uh, both this inequality and uh, this inequality. That gets me an epsilon for this term and an epsilon for this term, and then make h small enough that I get an epsilon for, uh, for this term. Okay. Um, so I have an arbitrary epsilon. I have an n. Once I've chosen that n, uh, now I have a fixed polynomial, Sn. See, here I have to choose the n first. Once I have a polynomial, then I can choose delta. I have a fixed polynomial. And for that polynomial, so there exists a delta such that when you add all of these things up, Let's see, f of z plus h minus f of z over h minus g of z. When you add all three of these things up, you get three epsilon. And epsilon was arbitrary, which means when you, which, which is the definition of limit. So the limit of this expression exists and is g of z. So if a function is analytic, then it has a derivative and the derivative is given by termwise differentiation. Z to the n turns into n, z to the n minus one. That's it. Does that make sense? Cool. Sri Ram's good. Thomas is good. Nick is good. Kayla. Thank you, Hannah. All right. All right. We're getting thumbs up now. People are waking up. Great. Okay. Um, what did I want to say about that? Right, let's, uh, here's an immediate corollary. Corollary, uh, F is analytic, implies not only is it holomorphic, but it's infinitely differentiable. Not only is it differentiable once, it's infinitely differentiable. I mean, that's not surprising because it's already analytic, so it should be described by its Taylor series, but actually we don't know that yet. Implies uh, F is in continuous, uh, sorry, complex, continuously, it's infinitely differentiable in the complex sense. It has infinitely many complex derivatives. Uh, each derivative, each, each derivative has same radius of convergence, has same R, and is given by termwise differentiation, and is given by termwise differentiation. This is just induction. Okay. 
It's given by termwise differentiation uh, of the terms. Any questions? No proof needed. We know how to do the induction on this. I mean, this is purely induction. Okay. Great. Next topic. Any questions on this? We're setting things up. We, we're not yet at the at the place where we're gelling with uh, with some good stuff. So um, let me pause for a second. So far, so good. Okay. So the next thing we want to talk about. We've talked about differentiation. Let's talk about integration. The first thing, you know, you might think, well, do we want to, they're complex numbers, so do we want to integrate over an entire region? Turns out that you get much more mileage from integrating over curves first. Uh, so let's, let's talk about integration. So this is a new section, integration over curves. Okay, so first of all, we need to understand what a curve is. So what's a parametrized curve or parametric curve? Parametric curve. That's just a function z from zero to one, or let's say a to b, just to be slightly more general, into c. Okay, so here's the complex plane. Here's z of a, and then z does something, and then it winds up somewhere else, and that's the, the other endpoint, z of b. It will be quite important that these be not only continuous, but continuously differentiable, which of course implies continuous. So continuously differentiable. So when I say parametric curve, I will assume that it's continuously differentiable. So this is in C1. Um, uh, what do I mean? I, I want the derivatives uh, at the endpoints at endpoints, we have one-sided derivatives. Z of a plus, z prime of a plus exists and is continuous, and z prime of b minus. You know what I mean. A plus means comet a from, from, the, from the right to the left, and come to b from the left to the right. OK. Continuously differentiable. At, end, at the endpoints, we have uh, one-sided derivatives. This is usually in this, unfortunately, this is what people in this part of the world call smooth. Smooth is no longer infinitely differentiable. It is now con continuously once differentiable. And that will be enough. Uh, we will also want uh, piecewise smooth. Piecewise smooth is that uh, z, again, from a to b is continuous and continuously differentiable on uh, a bunch of, let's say, a0, which is a, is less than a1, is less than a n, finitely many. Uh, we will not be considering infinite sequences of piece. Uh, that's uh, an unnecessary headache. So, so z is composed, so piecewise smooth is Z is smooth until you get to some point, and then it's smooth. What? How did that happen? It made, gave me a line. That's cool. Uh, anyway, so this is Z of A. This is Z of B. It's smooth, except finitely many places you change the definition or whatever. OK? Any, any questions about this? these trivialities? All right. Now, yes, sir. please. Um, does the is the Jordan curve theorem easy to prove for continuously differentiable loops? Uh, it, uh, it it's much e yes. There's a so there's a general Jordan curve theorem, which just needs continuity and uh, you have to be slightly careful. You have to be slightly careful. Um, for everything that we're going to do, I like Stein's approach. Stein's approach is we're not going to prove the Jordan curve theorem. Maybe at the very end, if you guys really want to, I'm happy to do it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice proof, but it actually somehow obfuscates what it is that you want to do with curves. What you want to do with, with curves is use toy contours. So in fact, all of our contours will be piecewise either linear, just straight lines, or uh, seg sectors of uh, arcs, arcs of circles. So for us, it will suffice for everything that we want to do, almost. There's one uh, 
counter example to what I'm about to say, in which case, yeah, the, it's smooth. The curve we want is smooth. For almost everything that we want to do, it'll be enough to use toy contours, which is straight lines, you know, piecewise functions that are where the pieces are straight lines or bits of uh, circles. That's it. And you can, you can do an awful lot with, uh, with just, just that. Of course, it's nice to have a general theory. And so that's where the Jordan theorem comes in. Uh, it'll explain to us what orientation is, which is, you know, you can come up with all kinds of crazy fractal things that are continuous, but uh, you tell me where the inside of the closed curve is and, and where the outside is. So that's the main difficulty with, with Jordan. Uh, we will avoid it as much as possible because we don't need it that much. Does that make sense? You happy with that? All right, so this is a parametric curve, but somehow the exact parametrization is too much. It's too much information. Let's say, you know, you parametrize a circle. So we both want to parametrize a circle and you say Z goes from zero to one to C and it's given by uh, Z of T equals E to the two pi I T. And I say, no, Z goes from zero to two pi to C, and Z is given by E to the IT. And we would both be parametrizing the same circle, just at slightly different speeds or something. And that's stupid. We shouldn't be having this fight. OK? So we need a definition of equivalence. It's the same curve, guys. Come on, who cares? Who cares if you're going to call it from 0 to 1, E to the 2 pi I, or from 0 to 2 pi, E to the I? OK, same curve. So definition. Z is equivalent to Z prime. Two curves are equivalent. So let's, let's be a little bit. So Z from A to B to C and is equivalent to Z hat, which let's say goes from C to D. There's no reason to have the same endpoints to C. If, so this is a definition, if and only if, of course, it's a definition. Um, if what? Well, there should be some change of variables from one to the other. If there exists, let's say T from CD to AB, uh, bijection, bijection, not an arbitrary bijection, a continuous bijection, continuous bijection. Um, with with what Z tilde of, let's see, T goes to, from C to D, that should be the same as, so let's see, um, what am I trying to say? Let's make S the variable of, so T takes a variable S, so Z tilde of S, S is in C and D, T of S will be in A to B, and so I can evaluate Z there. Now, there's a couple of things wrong with this definition. The first thing that's wrong with this definition is it allows this. We both have circles, but my circle goes this way and your circle goes that way. We do not want to allow that. Okay, so how are we going to force that the circles are, are followed by the same kind of function in the same direction. I don't really care if you're going to go super fast and then slow or something, whereas I'm going at a, at a fixed rate. But I don't want me going forwards while you're going backwards. Those are completely different curves as far as, uh, so uh, note, um, z minus, we can define this curve. This is the opposite curve, opposite curve will go from A, B to C and is given by Z minus of T is equal to, let's see, something like Z of A plus B minus T. If T is equal to A, then I get Z of B. And if T is equal to B, then I get Z of A. So this, this, un, this whatever Z does, whatever Z does, Z, uh, Z of A, whatever Z does going from A to B, that way 
z tilde goes from this a that way to z tilde of b, uh, z minus rather. I will get this right eventually, z minus, okay? These are different curves, different curves. It's crucial that they be different curves for our purposes, as you will see very soon. Okay, so how do I make sure that this t doesn't go backwards? Doesn't, uh, so this, is, this change of variables should not be allowed. What's wrong with this change of variables? What's the derivative of this function, a plus b minus t? Yeah, negative one. Everyone's, everyone's doing, uh, uh, what is it? Y, M, C, negative one, C, A. Um, yeah, negative one, right? So if T is allowed to have negative derivative, then it could go backwards and do some weird stuff that we don't want. So we need not only continuous, but we need uh, differentiable. Differentiable so that I can say that the derivative can't go backwards. Okay. And there's still one more problem. Does anyone know what it is? There's still one thing wrong with this definition, Nick. Uh, wrapping multiple times around a circle and similar. So wrapping multiple times is taken care of by insisting that it's a bijection. That's a good question. That's mm -hmm. right. You don't, what I don't want is Z goes to two Z. Uh, Z, uh, whatever, e to the 2it, which will wrap twice. But that will not be a bijection because it'll hit the same points multiple times. And anyway, I mean, wrap, you can't wrap multiple times by, uh, by following the same curve. Well, t won't be continuous if you do. You can sort of... Uh, Anyway, uh, that's less the issue. There's something, um, there's something we haven't proved. I said they're equivalent, but is this an equivalence relation? It's only one-sided. Does T have an inverse? Right, we need to, we need to be able to have an inverse uh, for this to be an equivalence relation. What will guarantee that T does have an inverse? It's a bijection, great. So doesn't that mean it has an inverse? Derivative should be non-zero. The derivative must be non-zero. So, uh, it, so be, being a bijection means it has an inverse, but that inverse need not be differentiable. If this derivative ever hits zero, then the inverse function can have a derivative that's infinity. Okay? So the one thing we have to do is take away zero as an option for the derivative. So that's, that's to make this an equivalence relation. This makes this a true equivalence relation. Relation. Can you read that? Can, you, can, you can guess that that word is relation, although it has small relation to the word relation. Okay. Okay, any, any questions? So far, so good? All right, so this is the definition of equivalence. Two curves are equivalent if there exists some change of variables from one to the other, from whatever its domain was to the, to the other's domain, so that, there's, uh, so that one is a change of variables of the other. We need it to be differentiable to make sure that the derivative is positive and we're moving in the same direction, and we need the derivative to be not zero, so we need it to be strictly positive uh, everywhere. And of course, continuous since it's differentiable. All right. All right. Um, good. Yeah, well, uh, sorry. I want it to be continuously differentiable so that it has a, a nice inverse. Um, so given this definition, you see what we're going to do is try to define integration on a curve, but I don't care which curve you take. So by a smooth curve, so definition, a smooth curve 
gamma means the equivalence class of a parametric curve. So this is a parametric curve up to equivalence. So by a smooth curve, I mean, give me any, par give me, give me any choice of representative for that curve. That's, that's a parametric curve. And then, well, I didn't care which one you gave me. And that is what we will mean. So we group all these curves by equivalence, and that's what I mean by a smooth curve. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see why this is a good definition. Um, yeah. Let's see why this is a good definition, and then we'll take a break. So why is this a good definition? Well, the first thing we want to do. So if if f from omega to c is continuous and gamma contained entirely in omega is uh, a smooth curve, then we define the integral over gamma of f of z dz. How should we define this? What does it mean to integrate? You have some function and you have some curve and you want to integrate f over that curve. What should that mean? What would you define it as? Can I say the wrong answer? Uh, you can say the wrong answer. OK, uh, so we can think of it as a function um, from R2 to uh, R2, right? Like uh, You're thinking of what is a function of R2 to R3? R2 to R2, F. R2 to R2. Uh, yep. What, F? Yep. OK. And then you take the path integral as a real function for the two variables. Yes, the, uh, that that's just fine. That's not the wrong. Why do you say that's the wrong answer? I mean, there are a few issues with that. Uh, for example, if you go, it doesn't uh, say the same over parametrization. Well, that's what also, I'm. That's exactly what I'm trying to get to. It depends on how you define. It depends on what you mean by take the, okay. the parameter curve over the path. I I, words, I know that if I defined it that way, uh, there would be a lot of issues, uh -huh. and it isn't the same. That's well, maybe I don't know what you mean by by the words okay. that you've the words okay. that you said. If I'm interpreting them the way I I want to, then it's the definition I'm trying to get you guys to say. Oops. <laughs> I think um. Uh, can, uh, um, I think what he meant was uh, like I think what he was his idea for something you shouldn't do is like loosely to think of, you know, the DZ things as being infinitesimal real things, okay. right? He was just taking the, um, yeah, yeah. And what I think you maybe should want to do is, I don't know, take F of Z of T times Z prime of T integrated over T, which seems to make more, then you, then since you're integrating over, a, um, a real thing, I guess it's easier to think of, of what you mean. And maybe you can prove that it doesn't matter how you par parametrize it and you get the same answer. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, Ishan, I was interpreting, I guess the interpretation you had in mind didn't have the Z prime of T in it. Is that what you're saying? You just choose any, yeah. So the wrong thing to do would be choose any parametrization, right? Z gamma, uh, gamma is a smooth curve, which means it's, it has, in, uh, uncountably many parametrizations. Um, so choose any one and then just integrate from A to B F of Z of T DT. That would be kind of your first attempt at this perhaps. Is that what you meant, Yishan? Oh, you, you were muted. That and there are a couple other issues. Like if you try to do the real version, right? The If you try to put a Z prime 
of t there, it wouldn't act like a two by two matrix. If you thought of the complex numbers as two by two matrix, it would act like a, uh, a I think a row vector, right? Well, Which would be just very different. Exactly. Two by exactly. One or one we're, by two we're, we're gonna use crucially this multiplication in the complex numbers. Yeah. yeah. So it's a very different thing is what I'm- Okay, uh, great. Wanted to emphasize that's all. Great, great. If, okay. Uh, Right, so the right thing to do is as you're moving along this curve, you should dz, what does dz mean? dz should mean z prime of t dt, since z is a function of t. I'm just following the chain rule, okay? So dz, dz means z prime of t, and then of course f of z is f of z of t. You take any parameterization, and now we have to prove a theorem, which is that, well, this definition is not a definition because it, it had, made a choice. So for this to be a re real definition, we need a lemma. Lemma, this definition is independent of choice. Definition is independent of parametrization. Why is that true? This is exactly what Ozan said. We have to, we have to check that when we made this choice, we have to make a choice because we have to, we don't know how to integrate over a general curve. A general curve is an equivalence class of parametric curves. Parametric curve, okay, this is what it, uh, this is what it means to integrate over a parametric curve. But now we've made some choice and won't we get different answers? So how do we prove this lemma? In other words, what, what do we really mean? If um, Z prime of S is Z of T S, Right? If z and z prime are z and z tilde, I said z prime. If z tilde of s is equal to z of t of s, exactly as before, when we had this notion of equivalence, uh, all the way back here, this notion of equivalence with t prime being strictly positive, um, then the two definitions, the two definitions with a z prime of t as opposed to with a z tilde of s as opposed to z of t should be the same. Okay, so let's look at, uh, at this definition. So I'm just making a change of variables. I'm making a change of variables. t goes to t of s. So t went from a to b. s will go from C to D. C to D. Have I lost you? So I've changed A and B. F of Z of T becomes F of Z of T of S. Nothing wrong with that. What is Z prime of T? DT. Well, let's differentiate both sides of this. If I differentiate both sides of this, I get z tilde prime of s. I'm differentiating with respect to s, if you like ds, is equal to z prime of t of s times t prime of s times ds. And of course, t prime of s ds is exactly what dt was representing as a differential. And so z prime of t dt, and so z prime of t right here, z prime of t dt is none other than this. This is z prime of t of s, t prime of s ds. Nick, I lost you. No? No, you're good. Anna? Hannah? Good? Michael, it's okay? Sriram, keep going? Okay. So that's it. This is the integral from C to D, F of of course, the very definition of this is that it's z tilde of s, z tilde of s. 
this becomes this. This is exactly z tilde prime of s ds. Which is what you would have done if you hadn't started with z, but started with z prime in the definition of parametric curve. It's f of z prime. I keep saying prime. You know that I mean tilde when I say prime, right? Okay. I write, I'm like word dyslexic. I write what I mean, but I don't say what I mean. So f of z, z tilde, I did it again, z tilde prime ds from c to d. That's exactly what you would have done uh, if you had just started with z prime as your parametrization instead of z. OK? All right. Let's take a break. Let's take a, I don't know, five minute break. Let's go. OK. So, um, so right, we just talked about parametric curves. Let's define the length definition. The length of gamma, which I'll write as L of gamma. What is that? It's the integral. So you take some, you take some parametrization of the curve. Z is an element of the equivalence class of all possible parametrizations. Let's say A to B and you integrate absolute value of z of t dt. Okay, so that's just the definition uh, of length, if you like. And let's prove a little lemma. If I integrate a curve, f of z dz, that is bounded by the soup of f on gamma times the length. I mean, this is a trivial little lemma. And of course, I need absolute values because that left side isn't. So what are the assumptions here? The assumption is f is a continuous curve. Uh, f is a continuous function from some open region. And, and uh, gamma is contained inside the, the domain of f. So I can evaluate f on gamma. OK, and the proof is, um, well, this is, by, by definition, by definition, this is equal to the integral from A to B. I choose some parametrization, doesn't matter which one I take, z prime of t dt. Yeah, Nick? Um, in your definition, if you take the absolute value of z prime inside the derivative, then can't you have a parametrization that like goes forward, backwards, and forwards again, and it's going to make the curve seem a lot longer? It would, that would be possible if I didn't insist on T prime. Oh, being right. Okay, positive. never mind. We're good. Though. No, that's a great question. It's not a never mind. It's exactly the point I wanted to make here. Not only are you not allowed to turn around, you can't even locally turn around. Okay, so the derivative is always strictly positive. By the way, if you turned around, it wouldn't be a bijection. So that we have fail safes to, uh, to ensure that this length really is measuring a length and not backtracking. Great, great question. Okay, so all I'm going to do is hit this with the triangle inequality, a to b, absolute value f of z of t, and then z prime of t, dt, and we're done because the absolute, uh, the soup, of course, of the absolute value of f. So if I pull out the largest possible value that z that f takes on gamma, that will be measured by that, and the rest is length, and the rest is length. I mean, together with the integral. OK, great. Uh, let's get to a couple of things. Can I step on the gas a little? Yeah, this is all like very basic stuff. Let's step on the gas. Definition. If f is a function and big F, so this is just some open, open region, and big F is also a function such that, which is holomorphic, Big F is holomorphic, such that, so I could, it makes sense to speak of the derivative of F. If the derivative of F is equal to little f, then big F is called, you would have called it maybe an antiderivative. In, in complex analysis, the terminology is primitive. A primitive of F is called a primitive of F. Okay. So antiderivative, 
in this context, we call primitive and theorem. Uh, let's say we have a continuous function if f, which is continuous, has primitive big F, and if we have a curve in omega, then the integral from A to B, F, uh, uh, the integral from A to B, the integral over gamma of F of Z dz is equal to, let's say, um, let's say Z starts, uh, let's say omega starts at W0 and ends at W1. So this is um, uh, gamma. Let's say, let me try again. Let's say gamma starts at omega zero and ends at omega one. Then what will be, what will the integral of f be? Should be f of omega one minus f of omega zero. If there's any justice in the world, this will be the formula. Okay, why is this true? This is again, just following following your nose on the definitions. What is the left-hand side? The left-hand side is an integral from A to B. I'm going to take some parametrization, f of z of t, z prime of t dt. Notice that f is f prime by definition. And notice that this whole thing is d dt of big F of z of t. By the chain rule. And now I just apply the real fundamental theorem of calculus and we're done. Okay? Is omega simply connected? So I don't know that omega is simply connected, but I know that uh, gamma is a curve. Okay. And being a curve means you're connected. I'm thinking of one over z going around. I don't. Yeah, I don't know that I have a primitive. Yeah. In fact, let's do that example. Let's let's do that example right now. So first of all, corollary. If f is a function and has a primitive and has a primitive big F, and it doesn't matter what I don't need to call it. You don't name the uh, the cows on your farm in case you have to oh, eat okay. more. Yeah, yeah, you well, see it's it. Not defined on. Oh, you need a branch cut. Okay. Well, all I'm all I'm my assumption is that it has a primitive. So that's the you'll see in a second. And if this curve is closed, closed, i.e., w zero is equal to w one. So the curve wherever it started, it does whatever it does. Actually, it's supposed to be simple. Well. I didn't say that yet. I will eventually. If, it, if it's a closed curve, it ends where it started, then the integral of a closed curve, which sometimes I'll write like that to remind you that it's closed, will be, it has a primitive. So we said it's f of w1 minus f of w0, but it's closed. So these two are the same. And so the integral over any closed curve of a continuous function that has a primitive, continuous so that I can make sense of the derivative. I guess I didn't explicitly say continuous. A continuous function, and it has a primitive, and I have a closed curve, then the integral is zero. And now let's do exactly what Nick said. Example. Okay, so let's do, let's do one of these. Um, let's say, f of z is equal to 1 over z. And let's say gamma is parametrized. Gamma is the unit circle. So how do you want to parametrize gamma? What do you guys like, 0 to 2 pi or 0 to 1? There's a right answer and a wrong answer. 0 to 1. 0 to 1 is the right answer. Excellent. You're a number theorist at heart. Z goes from zero to one to C is given by T goes to E to the two pi I T. Okay, what is the integral over gamma F of Z DZ? Take two minutes 
and compute it for yourself. Take three minutes. Don't try to do it. I don't, don't think about it. Just, just compute. This is a very key calculation. It's like the quintessential calculation of complex analysis. Give me a thumbs up when you're done with the computation. Ishan, you wrote it out, all the details? Essentially, yes. Yeah. yeah. You, you know the answer. Well, I also like did it in my head, like okay. the details in my head. All right. Thomas, thumbs up. Three rounds. Kailash, right? Doesn't say your name, yeah. Is anybody stuck? No, everybody looks hard at work. I'm gonna start slowly doing it alongside and hopefully catch up to you. Okay, A and B, zero to one. F of Z is E to the two pi I T. Z prime, what is Z prime of T? Is two pi I E to the two pi I T. That's pretty easy. Two pi I E to the two pi I T, DT. That's just the definition. F is e to the minus two pi i t. And that will of course cancel with that. And the integral dt is one, this is one. So all I'm left with is two pi i. Did anybody get that, that same thing? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. What's funny about two pi i? Not zero. Not zero. So uh, let's see, Kayla, what does that mean for this corollary? We had a closed curve, we integrated f, we didn't get zero. But this, this said, if you have to take a continuous curve and uh, if you could take a continuous function, one over z is continuous, we're staying away from zero, there's no, there's no problem. There's a problem with zero, but we're staying away from zero. It's not primitive. Does not have a primitive. Okay. Does not have a primitive. So this implies f of z does not have a primitive for any domain which contains the unit circle. I don't care what property you give me of your domain the function f of z cannot have a primitive for any open set that contains the unit circle. Okay? Great. Let's do one more thing. Uh, I guess I should call this a corollary. Why not? Sure, corollary. If f uh, from omega to c is holomorphic, so it has a derivative and f prime is zero on omega and omega is, uh, our regions are always open, but now I, I wanna insist that omega is also connected. Before we could have had omega is this blob and that blob, that could have been omega. So now I want it to be connected and open. Um, then, F is, ah, I gave it away. If the derivative is zero, what should we know about the function? 
Darn. Yeah, it's, I'll put the C back. Then F is a constant. They gave it away. Okay. Why is this true? Why is this true? You had a key exercise on your homework last week. What was it? Um, path connected and uh, connected are the same for open. For an open, yeah. Open and connected implies path connected. So what? So what? Fix any. So omega, whatever it is, it's connected. So pick any fixed point, fix any w0 in omega. For any w1 in omega, there exists some curve which starts at omega 0 and goes to omega 1 because it's path connected. Being connected implies path connected for an open set, not in general. Um, okay, so now we can integrate f prime on omega. And our theorem says that is f of omega 1 minus f of omega 0 because f prime has a primitive and that primitive, and uh, so, and that primitive is f, right? f prime is a continuous function. On the other hand, what is f prime? Yeah, we assume the derivative was zero on all of omega. So we're integrating zero. Even I don't have to do that calculation. which means f1 of omega 1 is equal to f of omega 0. And that's true for all omega 1 in omega, since this was arbitrary. So f is exactly constant. OK. Any questions on that? Professor? Rishab. Uh, can this can this be proved using Cauchy Riemann equation also like because it is holomorphic on an open set uh, del f by del z bar is zero and uh, del f by del z is zero so by the partial derivatives everything is zero so it is constant um, yes so so something like this holds much more generally uh, right if if the derivative I mean any notion of derivative if it's the correct notion of derivative it should be that if the derivative is zero then the function is constant. Uh, so this, this is a glimpse into a much bigger world uh, that, that uses much less than, than the power of complex analysis. But actually, um, well, well, we'll, we'll see. There, there's, uh, this is an important little, it, it seems like a stupid corollary. Like this is all, we haven't done anything that's not obvious yet, I think. Uh, we're about to get to some striking consequences uh, of this. Um, all right, we only have a few minutes. Let's do exactly the uh, example I think Ishan was asking us about. So what do we say? Let f of z equal z or something? And let the curve gamma be the straight line from 0 to, what, 1 plus i? I was thinking constant, but yeah. Oh, f constant. of z equals constant. It'll be even more fun if it's z. All right, fine. You want to make it constant? Fine, let's make it constant. One. It just seems a lot clearer that it will be different. That you expect it to be the same, but it ends up being different when... Well, why do you expect it to be the same? You're integrating over a curve. So you're asking about, so here's zero, and here's one plus i. And let's take this straight line, and let's I, do the computation. So everybody compute what the integral over gamma f of z dz is. You have two minutes.
Give me a thumbs up when you're done. Sean's got it, Diane's got it. Thumbs down from Nick. I just think I made a mistake. Okay. I mean, if I was in like high school and I saw this, I would go, duh, you write integral from zero to one plus I of one DZ. I know what that is. That's Z evaluated from zero to one plus I. So that's one plus I minus zero. Okay, one plus I. Not realizing how many god awful, you know, that none of this makes any sense. But actually, it makes complete sense. And it's exactly the, I mean, we, we sh it should be that we, we should have the right notion of different, of what this, what this symbol should mean is that all of this should be, actually be okay. Do you, do you see what I mean by that, Ishan? If we set things up right, then you should be able to write some nonsense like this and have it just work out exactly right. But let's see what you have to do for real for now. This is kind of like when you first learned the, the rules of different, like uh, that it's a limit of f of z plus h minus f of z over h. And then you learn that the derivative of x to the n is n x to the n minus one. You're like, oh, I never have to do that crap again with the limits. I just know some rules, right? So it's the same thing. This, this, this does make sense once we know enough rules. And in fact, we already know enough rules because we know of a primitive. We, we, we could have done this exactly by this, by, by this method by saying a primitive is f of z equals z because the derivative of z is one, which of course is little f. So, so this is all totally fine by our previous theorem because z is the primitive and, we, and you would evaluate the primitive at the two endpoints. But let's do it parametrically just to do the exercise. So uh, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna parametrize this? Let's see, say, let's say z of t is equal to t plus i t as t goes from uh, zero to one. That'll have, that'll be the straight line. And so, so this integral, so the integral is equal to an integral from zero to one. f of z is one, z prime is one plus i and integrated dt, which is indeed one plus i. One plus i is a constant and that and the rest has length one. So however you did it, it all makes sense which means we have, we've made the right definitions for these things. All right, so that was just some very basic stuff. And on Friday, we'll get to some highly non-trivial consequences of these rather simple uh, ideas. Any questions?